front of the screen looking at the YouTube video. And in this YouTube video, the take home messages, the launch was extremely successful. And uh, we saw, we could see actually, thanks to, oh, sorry, oh, that's very bad. We could see, thanks to these uh, cameras installed uh, on, uh, on the rocket, the different phases when, for instance, the fading nose of the rocket, well, I'm afraid you have to look at it from the very beginning. Okay. So, when the fading nose of the rocket uh, re uh, opened, when uh, the two stages uh, of the final stages of the uh, <coughs> Yeah, including the satellites was uh, was put in orbit and eventually the, or the, the launch was declared successful uh, in perfectly in time, 15 minutes after the launch started. Um, X-ray astronomy is a relatively young science. It started uh, around 50 years ago with the discovery of the first uh, celestial source astrophysical source emitting X-rays. This source uh, was named X1 with uh, some lack of fantasy, so the first ray X-ray source in the sky in the constellation of Scorpius. And uh, this is actually a plot from the original paper which shows the discovery. And uh, in this plot you have on the y-axis you see actually numbers uh, which looks like degrees but are actually coordinates pretty much like the coordinates, uh, the latitude on our, the longitude on our Earth, but actually this is on the sky. And on the y-axis is the number of events detected by an instrument, an X-ray instrument that was put on, a, on, on this uh, experiment. And uh, actually, today a colleague, a colleague of mine reminded me that the original goal was actually to see if it were possible to detect uh, X-rays uh, from the Moon scattered from the sun. But actually what these uh, researchers discovered was actually that there was a much brighter source of X-rays in a position of the sky where actually no obvious other source, optical source, was visible. And that is the whole start of X-ray astronomy. A start which uh, 40 years later, so one decade ago more or less, led to attributing a Nobel Prize for physics to the first author and the main scientific mind behind this experiment, Professor Giacomo. For uh, many decades, X-ray astronomy has been a monopoly of uh, three big actors. The United States, through NASA, Europe, primarily through an agency of which I will tell something later, but also with individual nations, and Japan. Uh, the situation is now radically different, and the reason why I am a Sicilian, I'm talking in front of an Indian audience of a Japanese mission, is not by chance. <laughs> it's due to the fact that Israel astronomy is experiencing a, a sort of Asian spring, as I call it in analogy to spring in other domain of human life, which happened recently in uh, Africa and uh, other parts of Asia. So nowadays, uh, it's no longer true that there are only three actors dominating the scene. Asian nations like India, like China, they are actually taking their uh, responsibility and role in this, uh, in this field, and they are actually at the forefront of the research. The next, uh, well, the four, next four uh, X-ray missions that have been launched or will be launched over the past six months and the next year, they are all based, they are all based entirely or primarily in Asia. Astrosat, India, Itomi, led by the Japanese Space Agency, HXMT, China, and Spectrum East Gamma, which is a collaboration between Russia and Germany. So Asia is now the core, the focal point of this science. And actually scientists all over the world are now looking at what happens in India, at what happens in Japan, at what is going to happen soon in China, as the reference for their research. And that's, in my opinion, a momentum change 
of the way this science is developing and will develop in the future. Now, Itomi is led by the Japanese Space Agency with a fundamental contribution of NASA, but it's not only a Japanese mission. It's actually a large collaboration of 61 institutions and over 250 scientists who have been worked to prepare the mission, to build the instrument, and to prepare the operations that are now ongoing. And also to define the science goals of the mission, which is on, on which I will, I'm going to tell you something very soon. Now, I don't uh, want to, you know, I don't hope that you read all these institute names, but I want you to concentrate on one of them, which is the European Space Agency, and uh, the bare fact that they pay my salary, and also they paid my travel to come here, gives me the pleasant duty to tell you and remind you what the European Space Agency is. Forty years ago, European nations, a small group of European nations, decided that if we want to exploit uh, space for purely Pacific purposes in an efficient way, we have to pool resources together. And that's where the European Space Agency were born. The European Space Agency in this moment gathers 22 member states. Uh, actually, the number is continuously growing. We had six new member states in the last five years. One of them, there is an additional member which is actually not in Europe, which is Canada. And all these countries, they pool their resources together in order to promote for exclusively peaceful purposes the cooperation among the member states in space research, technology, and applications. So the European Space Agency does not deal only with science, with scientific mission, it deals also with telecommunication, it deals with uh, uh, commercial exploitation of uh, space activities. So it's actually a very wide uh, range of agency. But you know, don't worry, I'm not going to talk about primarily about money today. I'm going to talk about what actually the focus of the European Space Agency activities, which is science. And in the framework of these efforts and the collaboration between space agencies, ESA and some European member states participate also to Italy. And that's the reason why a Sicilian is standing in front of you talking about the Japanese mission in India. Now, let me now tell you something about what this satellite is. Let me first start with a very basic question. X-ray astronomy is a young science, and the reason why it's a young science is that it requires a satellite. But why do we need satellites? Well, we need satellites because we are alive. If uh, questions from Yuka are not allowed. <laughs> why do we need X-rays? I'm coming later to this point. So, we need satellites because fortunately for us, or maybe not, maybe we would have developed in a different and more beautiful way, but uh, fortunately for us, the atmosphere blocks the X-rays. So we don't see on ground X-rays coming from celestial sources. So if we want to measure X-rays, we have to send satellites in space. But then, uh, and so that's our satellites, this is Itomi. Itomi is uh, a 2.7 tons machine. It's uh, 14 meters long, like a big track. It's 9 meter wide. These uh, two wings that you see extended are the solar panels, which collect light from the sun and powers 3,500 watts batteries on board. And these batteries power a series of uh, systems, scientific systems, that we use in order to make scientific measurements. We have three teles four telescopes, and on the focal plane of each of these telescopes, there is a different instrument. And the reason why we want to have different instruments is that each instrument is specialized to perform a certain kind of X-ray measurement. And some of the instruments that Itomi contains are the most advanced instruments in their kind ever flown. And that's the reason why the community is so excited, because 
the measurements that he told me we'll be able to make, and I'm going to show in this talk, are unique. They've never been done before, and they will allow us to get new science that has never been possible so far. Now, now we come to Yuka's question. Uh, we introduced Yuka Nevalainen, he's one of our uh, X-ray colleagues, and uh, he's one of the most friendly, uh, friendliest person that I've ever met in my life. So if you have questions uh, that I don't know to answer and you can answer, I will ask you to answer. I hope that you shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's take an example of the why we want to observe the sky in X-rays. Have you ever heard about the sun? You know, except today, the sun is this big yellow ball in the sky, at least 50% of the time present in the sky. Um, you know, apart from the joke, not very well managed. Uh, the sun is, looks to us as a sort of yellowish ball, and we know that this, uh, the sun, the surface that we see with our eyes of the sun, has a temperature of the order, it's, it's gas, it's hot gas, with a temperature of the order of 6,000, more or less, Kelvin. Now, chances are that actually the sun emits not only these optical rays, but also these mysterious X-rays. So let's look at actually what the sun, how the sun looks like in X-rays. That's an image taken by an American satellite, the Yoko satellite, and that shows a typical day, a typical snapshot of how the sun looks like in its rays. And you immediately see that there are two main differences with respect to our standard image of the sun in optical light. The first difference is that most of the surface is actually black. It's not an effect of uh, false color. The surface is really black. It doesn't emit anything. And the second strange thing is you see, the zone where you see emission is extremely patchy and irregular. It's not like the nice, smooth, yellow surface that we look with our eyes, that then you look with a telescope in optical. It's not as smooth, but sure, you don't see actually in, in, in the optical image these huge, strange, regular structures, which are actually, you know, they look like some loops actually going, uh, starting and ending uh, at two points of the sun's surface. Now, the funny thing is that if scientists can measure, and they can, the temperature of the gas responsible for this loop, that's one million degrees. And I told you, hmm, that's interesting, but the surface of the sun was 6,000 degrees. So, you know, obviously, there is something weird happening, allowing this gas to reach a temperature of one million degrees, when the surface on which these loops seem to be anchored is 1,000, well, 500 times less, uh, and less lower temperature. That's another example of uh, the difference between looking at the sky in the optical and in its rays. This is Jupiter, planet, that's the image in the optical, and that's the image in X-rays, where actually we see only small regions close to the poles, where actually something happens, but the rest of the surface is completely black. So in a nutshell, the reason why we want to look at the sky in X-rays is that when you look at the sources emitting X-rays, your image of the sky changed completely. So it is as if we would be looking at a different universe. And in some sense, we are looking at a different universe. Because so far, I will not explain what its rays are. But somewhat I was alluding to what its rays are when I was showing the plot of the, you know, which radiation can actually reach the surface of the Earth, and which one cannot. X-rays, the visible light, as well as the radio, as well as the gamma rays, they are all forms of electromagnetic radiation. They are waves traveling through space, 
and carrying energy through space. And from the physical point of view, the only difference between an X-ray light and an optical light is the distance between two consecutive peaks of this wave, the quantity that we call wave. When we go to X-rays with respect to the visible light, the distance between uh, these two peaks becomes short, and we call this distance wavelength. Now, physicists characterize these waves uh, using different quantities. They use the wavelength, the distance between the peaks, they use a quantity which is called the frequency, which is actually uh, the inverse of the time uh, between uh, the passage of two consecutive peaks, or they use energy. These are the generate way of ways of describing a wave. Because actually, wavelength, frequency, and energy, they all describe uniquely the the, the electromagnetic type of electromagnetic waves. Otherwise stated, an X-ray light has a certain wavelength, or I can say has a certain frequency, or I can say has a certain energy. And X-rays have a shorter wavelengths, higher frequency, and higher energy. Now, energy is a very interesting concept, but we can translate actually in something which is more uh, immediate to understand for our daily experience, which is, of, for instance, the temperature of the gas. The gas, I can convert the energy associated to these uh, waves of light to the temperature that a certain bowl of gas needs to have in order to emit waves at this frequency, at this energy. For instance, I told you the sun is a, a yellowish ball. So it emits from the surface radiation which is more or less of a yellow color. Yellow color is here and corresponds to gas with temperatures of the order of 6,000 Kelvin. If I want the same gas, well, actually not exactly the same, but if I want some gas to produce X rays, I have to increase at least the temperature up to several millions of degrees. And actually, it's just what I showed you with this loop emitting X-rays in the sun. They emit X-rays because they have a temperature of million degrees. Or I can use another way of expressing the same concept, which is maybe not terribly visible. For instance, I can express the energy of a wave in terms of the velocity that an electron has, you know, the, a velocity that an electron with that energy has. And if I consider the range of the electromagnetic spectrum that Hitomi is able to cover, it corresponds to the energy that an electron has when it goes from 1% to 50% of the velocity of light, which, as you know, is the largest possible velocity that any physical phenomenon can have, and any information can be transmitted. So that's the band where, so that's the range of physical phenomena of energies, temperature, and velocities that Itomi is probing. Itomi probes the physical phenomena where gas has million degrees, where particles move with velocities which are a not negligible fraction of the speed of light. And this allows us to see the universe in a completely different way. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you have to use two. Um, ah, 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 that's a good idea. I need you. Um, Oh, yes. But with Itomi, we want to do something, you know, the strength, one of, the strength of Itomi is that we're also able to use its rays 
to measure not only the temperature of the gas emitting the uh, X-ray radiation, but actually to make much more accurate measurements of other quantities of the gas in the universe, like the density or the chemical composition. And the reason why this is possible is based on a concept that we like calling spectroscopy. Now, a spectrum is simply, in science in general, not only in astronomy, a distribution of, thought of the amount of light that we see or the amount of energy that we detect as a function of frequency or energy or wavelength. And, uh, you know, if we are approximate or consider a nucleus as a structure where, sorry, an atom where the electrons are allowed only to uh, stay on certain uh, discrete levels, as we know it happens, so electrons in an atom are allowed not to have whatever available energy, but only a certain discrete number of energies. When an electron goes from a higher energy level E2, to a lower energy level E1, losing energy, it emits a photon of light, so a basic element of light, of energy of light, whose energy is equal to the difference between the higher level and the lower level. That's basic concept of you know, atomic physics. This means that if I have a gas where lots of this uh, discrete energy transition occurs, where I have lots of electrons which goes from one level to another, I expect that when I measure the spectrum, so the distribution of energy as a function, the distribution of light as a function of energy, I would expect that these differences of energy, E2 minus E1, E3 minus E2, E3 minus E1, are sort of preferential energy where I will, get that I will measure in my spectrum. And that's actually an example of a real X-ray spectrum which has been measured long ago, long ago means 10 years ago, with an instrument on board of an American US satellite called Chandra, named this way in honor of the Indian astronomer and astrophysicist Chandra Sekhar. So this is a real plot from a science paper. So a tool instrument uh, tool uh, for professional astronomers. In this plot, the y the x-axis, so on this axis we show wavelength. So the wavelength of the incoming detected light by the detector. And on the y-axis, we measure how many photons, how much light we detect in this star, AB Doradus. One star, cool star, one of millions of stars in our galaxy. And you see that it happens exactly what I, ex why I anticipated. You know, the spectrum has a sort of a continuous continuum pedestal, but then a specific energy you see peaks. And these peaks uh, correspond to the difference in energies between transitions in an atom. The nice thing is that these energy differences depend on the element. And actually, you see in this plot the element and their uh, ionization state, so how many electrons the atoms emitting this line have, you see them labeled. You see this tiny line is due to nitrogen, uh, this tiny other tiny lines to oxygen 7, oxygen 7 means oxygen so ionized that only one electron is left. This line is uh, oxygen 8, so two electrons are left, one electron is left. You see iron, neon, manganese. So these lines in itself are telling us which elements constitute the gas emitting the plasma. You may say, well, why is it interesting? You know, the gas is gas, no? you know, it's like the earth that we breathe, you know. 
we, we know which elements they are in the air, yes. We know which elements they are in the air or the earth. But the composition of the gas in an arbitrary region of the universe does not need to be, and it is not the same as on the Earth. So we want to know which is the composition of the gas in the universe, in different regions of the universe, for reasons that will be even more even clearer later. So if we measure how much light we detect in a specific transition, we can determine an astrophysical quantity, and in short, we can measure the, this integral on many lines of different elements, we can determine a quantity which is called abundance. So the ratio of the various elements in the plasma emitting this gas. But not only that, we have a very powerful tool not only to measure what elements are responsible for the emission, but how they move. This tool is called the Doppler effect. It's an effect whereby if a source of light or a source of sound is moving with respect to me, the wavelength, or otherwise say, the frequency, or otherwise say, the energy of the wave that I receive changes. In particular, if a source of light is coming towards me, I will measure an increase of the wavelength. So a decrease of the increase of the decrease. So if it comes toward me, it's the opposite of redshift. So increase of energies and decrease of weight. And the other way around. So we can apply this principle to celestial objects. If a celestial object, like the star I was showing you before, for instance, is not moving with respect to us. The wavelength at which I measure a certain peak in the spectrum is purely determined by the atomic physics. But if the source of light is going away, I will measure less energy or lower frequency or larger wavelength. If the source of light is coming towards me, I will measure more energy, higher frequency, smaller wavelengths. So if we come back at the working example before, in this spectrum, if I measure that this peak corresponds to a wavelength, which is not what the atomic physics predicts, most likely this is due to the fact that there's gas emitting this wavelength is moving with respect to us. <coughs> and I can tell how fast and in which direction the gas is. Um, this is all very nice, but you know, X-rays have some very nice properties, allows us to probe uh, the universe in uh, ranges and domains that are inaccessible to other wavelengths, to other kind of light, but there is a problem. How can we actually measure X-rays? Because, you know, by definition, and we know by our daily experience if we have ever made an X-ray chest or whatever other X-ray measurements of our body, X-rays are extremely penetrating. If I just take a mirror, and I put a mirror in front of an X-ray light, and I stay there sufficiently enough, I will die very soon. Because X-ray light goes through normal mirrors. Goes through the mirrors. Whereas optical light is reflected. So we need to find a trick for us to be able actually to direct the X-ray lights where we want. It is where the detectors are located. And the trick is actually using a technique which is called grazing incidence, which is simply making sure that our mirrors are actually hit by the X-ray light at a very small angle. And below a certain angle, actually due to the laws of classical optics or classical physics, 
lights are no, even X-ray lights are no longer going through the mirror, but they can be actually reflected by the mirror. So what we do in X-ray astronomy is building uh, telescopes, which are actually made of many, 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 many nested shells. Each of these shells actually is hit by the X-rays coming from the source very, very far away in the universe, and therefore we can assume that the rays are coming along parallel beams, they hit these mirrors at a very small angles, and therefore they don't go through the mirror, they are deflected. They are deflected, and they can be concentrated in a location where we can put an X-ray sensitive detector. This technology is not new. This uh, arrangement was actually devised already in uh, the 50s. So, what is new actually in Itomi is not the fact that we use uh, this kind of arrangement of mirrors in order to focus X rays uh, towards the detector. But what is really new is that for the second time in the history of X ray astronomy, we are able to build hard X ray telescopes. You may have seen probably in the video there was the soft X-ray telescope and the hard X-ray telescope. Soft and hard doesn't mean that the soft are uh, oh, telescope and the hard X-ray telescope are brute. This refers to the energy of the photons that can be focused. The hard X-ray telescope they focus photons with a higher energy that we call conventionally harder. So, the, one of the two important novelties in Itomi is the fact that we have hard X-ray telescopes. So that we can make images in an energy range with photons at the highest energy ever done before. I said we are the second because a small American satellite pioneered this technique called New Star, and it was launched a few years ago. But new star has only this, but we have something more, and even more important. We have in one of our focal plane a detector which is able to measure X-rays by measuring the change in temperature that the energy that the X-ray deposits on a certain material creates. And this is a very accurate way of measuring the energy of the incoming point is actually in certain regime, in certain energy band, the most accurate way to determine the energy, to measure the energy of incoming photon. So by combining these two new technologies, Hitomi is unique. It's state of the art, space state of the art observatory, and will allow us to make measurements never done before. So what are these new measurements that we want to do? No much and no less, one of the main things that we want to do is to unveil the history of the universe, call us models. So this is one of the hands uh, representation of the history of the universe in a wine cup that one can find on the internet. Actually, this is from a press release of the Italian uh, Astrophysical Institute, so it's not too bad. So, in a nutshell, our idea of the universe is that the universe starts with um, singularity, a Big Bang, a stage of very accelerated uh, expansion of the universe called inflation. At the beginning, uh, matter and radiations were so tightly coupled together that we cannot actually see anything from the very early stage of the universe. But then, slowly, matter and light start decoupling, and we start being able to see actually light from the universe. But at the beginning, there is actually not much emitting light, because there is no stars, no galaxies. So we have to wait a little bit, some uh, of the order of uh, 400 million years before we get the first stars formed and the first stars start emitting light that we can observe. 
Then we wait another uh, 600 million years and we get the first galaxies. And then these galaxies evolve. And we arrive at the situation where we are now, where there are planets uh, in, around the star, our own galaxies, many galaxies surrounding it. You know, all this evolution is uh, essentially an attempt of building more and more complicated structure from an initially un undifferentiated unit. Now, theoreticians believe that this evolution actually does not happen in a casual way, but it follows a certain pattern. These are not real images, these are simulations. And they show matter in a universe in an ideal very big box of the universe, when the universe was very old, when the universe was less old, when the universe was very recent. And you see, at the beginning, you see just a sort of a confused, a diffused distribution of matter without any clear structure. But the more the universe evolved towards now, the more actually you see that the universe evolves, coalesces, in some sense, into filaments. And along these filaments, you see dots. And you may say, oh, OK, I understand. These dots are stars. Mm, no. Well, these dots are galaxies. Mm. These dots are huge things. These dots are clusters of galaxies. So a group of galaxies which are so close together that they feel the mutual influence through gravity. But actually, you know, what we see when we observe a galaxy is only just uh, a fraction of actually the whole matter which, which is present in that region of the universe. Cluster of galaxies are actually one of our best experimental tools to investigate matter that we can't see, which is, once again, with not big fantasy called dark matter. This is a image of a cluster of galaxies from a press release of a real paper, once again based on a Chandra result published a couple of years ago, which shows you what actually this cluster of galaxies are made of. They are the galaxies that we see in optical, by definition of cluster of galaxies. But then, and these galaxies are all these discrete white points that you see, there are also some foreground stars and some other things, but you know, many of them, or many of the white points in this plot are just galaxies, pretty much like ours, our Milky Way, maybe with a different shape, but you know, essentially they are a collection of stars living together, gravitationally bound together. But then there are other components in a cluster of galaxies. You see this colorful blob, they represent distribution of other matter which is not in the galaxy, which is between or among the galaxies. The pink one is visible. It's visible in X-rays. So it's hot gas, million degrees, that we can measure. And this is another example of why we want to see a better sky in X-rays as opposed to optical. If I would look at this region only in the optical, I would see only the individual galaxies. But if I look at X-rays, I realize that among the galaxies, there is lots of hot gas, which is actually, in mass, a much more important component. But there is more than that. And the blue is actually matter that we don't even see. We know that it's there because we know that we can calculate the gravitational effect of this matter on the galaxies and on the gas that we see, but we don't have any direct way of measuring it. So, take home message here is that, well, anyway, one of the most important components when we observe a cluster of galaxies is hot gas. That's what we expect to observe in, with Itomi of one of these big balls of gas, blobs of gas in a cluster of galaxies. Once again, this is a spectrum, here is the energy, using the funny units that X-ray astronomy like to use, which is kilo-electron volts. But you know, kilo-electron volts is just the units. 
you could imagine here there could be wavelength, uh, there could be energy, uh, sorry, there could be energy in another unit, or there could be frequency, you know, just a matter of units. And on the y-axis, just the quantity of light that we expect to measure. And you know, you've already seen a plot like this. When I've shown you the working tool of an X-ray astronomer, the spectrum taken by Chandra of a star, we see once again lots of lines. And each of these lines corresponds to a given element. So we can tell about the gas in the galaxy cluster, the composition, the abundance, the temperature, the density. This is in itself already very important and interesting, but we can do something more with this data. We can constrain the evolution of the universe. Why? I showed you this galaxy cluster forms at the density in homogeneity of these filaments that I showed in the simulations. So if I can measure the mass in a cluster, and I can do these measurements on a large number of clusters, I have an observational constraint on the models which describe the evolution of the universe. So I can tell how actually the universe evolved to arrive to the present state. So I simply needed to measure the mass. How do I measure the mass? I use X-ray astronomy. Because I can assume that the gas in this, uh, in this the, the hot, the gas and the dark matter in the galaxy cluster is in equilibrium, in hydrostatic equilibrium. So essentially, this means that it's uh, dynamically stable against the competing pressure of its own gravity and uh, the pressure of the, of the gas. So, and in order to calculate the mass within a certain radius, I have to apply a certain formula, which is the formula coming from the physics of the hydrostatic equilibrium. You know, even if you can't follow the detail of the formula, then let me just highlight the three important elements. This formula is an equation, so it has a left-hand side and a right-hand side. The left-hand side is what we want to measure, the mass within a certain radius, which allows us to constrain the evolution model of the units. On this side, there is the gas density, and the pressure of the gas due to its thermodynamics. Now, these two quantities can be measured in X-rays, and honestly, in order to measure them, you don't need atomic. You can do more or less with existing satellites. And in fact, what people do typically, if I'm wrong, correct me, since we don't know how to calculate this directly observationally, we assume that it doesn't exist. Well, I assume some value for it. Oh, we assume some value. More or less arbitrary. If this is wrong, our calculation of the mass will be wrong, and our constraint on the evolution model of the universe will be wrong. And they are. At least I have to tell they are, otherwise Hitomi doesn't seem to be But with Hitomi, we will have a way to determine this one, because we will be able to measure the energy of the incoming photons from this blob of gas in the cluster much more accurately than we can do now. And this is, uh, once again, an example of a spectrum that you, we expect to measure. And the different curves represent the different values of the turbulent velocity, from which the turbulent pressure can be measured. And you see that depending on the values, the measurements that we're going to do with Hitomi is completely different. So Hitomi will be able to tell us how important this term is, and therefore to say, to gain confidence on these measurements, which in turn is useful to constrain models of the evolution of it. Um, let me also add something that we hope we will be able to do, which is maybe able to discover what this dark matter is made of. 
we know that dark matter is actually a much more important composition in mass of the universe with respect to the visible light. Stars, the diffuse hydrogen and helium gas, or even higher elements, these are only 5% of the mass of the universe. But this dark matter is five times more, is uh, on the order of 23% of the mass of the universe. Now, what is this dark matter? Well, I have no idea. But fortunately, I'm not the only one who has no idea what it is. We know what it is not. It's very unlikely that they are invisible, invisible celestial objects. Because, not because these objects do not exist, and I will show you later that they do exist, but because they are not sufficient, they are not enough of these invisible celestial objects in the universe to make up the quantity of dark matter that we observe. Or there could be undetected particles, strange particles that we have not seen yet. They are predicted by models of uh, you know, particle, particle physics models, but we have not seen them yet. One of them is called the sterile neutrino. Sterile neutrino is a neutrino, is one of the particles, one of these particles of the uh, basic particle physics model. And uh, typically neutrinos are, uh, uh, sense they are uh, affected by two of the four basic forces of nature, gravitation and weak nuclear force. But sterile neutrinos are peculiar because they are only affected by gravity. We believe, or some, part, some, some versions of the models of particle physics believe that sterile neutrinos exist. They have been searched, but not found yet. Now, the important thing is that if the sterile neutrino exists, when it decays, it produces probably X-rays. And X-rays exactly in the regime where he told me is most sensible. Now, this is a, once again a spectrum of a galaxy cluster. And you know, we look at galaxy cluster to search for these particles. Because I've just shown you that in uh, galaxy clusters there is lots of dark matter. So they are an obvious place to look for candidates of dark matter. And you once again recognize you know, lots of these nice lines. So, which is the lines corresponding to the sterile neutrino? One million dollars per. The, uh, astronomers should not answer. <laughs> <laughs> is this one? No. This one? No. 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 Even this one, no is this tiny bit. That's why this measurement has never been possible in the past. Or it has been claimed, but it has been very controversial. Only he told me we'll be able to, thought, to identify the energy of the incoming light in this region so accurately that if this line exists, we will be able to measure it. And if this Will be, measurement will be possible, this will be probably one of the major achievements of X-ray astronomy in the decade. But we don't know. Remember, this is what we expect to see. The spectra have not been seen yet. At least uh, have not been seen by you. Have you seen? Okay. Let's go now to another fascinating topic, which is closer to my heart, black holes. Um, in, uh, in the second half of the 18th century, uh, a clergyman with a passion for geology started thinking uh, deeply about it, you know, a problem related to a very simple daily experience that we have on Earth. You know, we all know that if I want to send a rocket into space from the Earth, I have to, you know, 
to give this rocket a certain minimum velocity to escape the gravitational force, the gravitational field of the Earth. Uh, Newton, a couple of uh, decades earlier, had formulated the idea that maybe the light was also composed of small particles. And he said, so this uh, clergyman, John Mitchell, he said, well, if this is true, I can in principle imagine that there is a star which is so massive that the velocity required for the light to escape from this, uh, from this star is so high that actually the light cannot escape from the star. The velocity is so high that it's essentially impossible to reach it. And he even calculated actually the diameter that the, such a star that he called the dark star should have. Now Mitchell was an extremely intuitive person. He even said if these dark stars exist, they must reside in binary systems. So there must be a normal star emitting light as all the stars that we know in the optical sky, but within, but orbiting with it, with it, so together with it, there should be also one of these dark stars. And this is the place where we have to look for them. Now, this, the, the concept of dark star over there was then, you know, taken away, taken again by Laplace a couple of decades later, and then later, uh, you know, with the evolution of general relativity in uh, relativity in the 20th century, we know now that black holes are uh, a inescapable solution of Einstein's general relativity, although we don't uh, represent them any longer as dark stars, but more a sort of deformation of the fabric <coughs> of the universe, of the space-time fabric of the universe, so regions where there are singularities, and actually nothing that is present in this singularity can escape, even the light, and actually things which are close to the region where this singularity is present feel a very strong gravitational attraction, and they may end up falling into this singularity. And black holes actually identify or divide the universe in regions. On one side, the regions from which we can get light, we can get uh, accelerated particles, we can receive information from. And the region within a boundary which is called event horizon, and everything beyond this event horizon is simply inaccessible for us. We know nothing of what happens beyond and no information, no ray of light, no matter can come more or less from beyond the event horizon. So we nowadays know that these black holes are an inescapable consequence of Einstein generally. Now, as astrophysicists, we know also that black holes are not only a mathematical construction, but they exist in the universe. We had many reasons to believe it even before the extraordinary discover of uh, the gravitational waves. And uh, one of the most interesting comments that I read about the recent discovery of the gravitational wave <laughs> is somebody who posted on Twitter or Facebook, you know, not an astronomer, who posted on Facebook, on Twitter, a comment like, oh, nice, this gravitational wave stuff is very nice, but by the way, this also proves that black holes exist. And that's a very important point. <coughs> now, uh, you may think that I'm pulling your legs, but black holes are extremely simple things, at least astrophysical black holes. They are actually the simplest objects in the universe. Because they can completely describe by three quantities. The mass charge, and the spin. Spin is what you can intuitively think of, how fast they rotate in relativistic terms. Now, can we know these quantities? Well, the mass is actually, believe it or not, it's relatively easy to measure the mass of a black hole. 
Because you can, if the black hole is surrounded by hot gas and you can measure the velocity of the gas, maybe through X-ray spectroscopy, you can get the mass. Pretty much the same way as you can measure the mass of the sun knowing the orbit of the planets surrounding. The charge, I don't think that there is any clear way to measure it. I heard that maybe by measuring uh, this gravitational wave from collapsing black holes, we can have an idea if they are charged or not. But honestly, we have no idea how to measure the charge of a black hole. And there is no reason to believe that black holes have any charge. The universe is neutral on the Earth. So why should black holes be an exception? It remains the spin. And the spin is a quantity that we can measure only in its space. Only in its space. Now, how to find black holes? Well, black holes are present at the center of almost any galaxy. But some of the galaxies, they have a privilege. Not only they have a black hole, but this black hole is active. So this means it emits a quantity of light which is much beyond, much bigger than the quantity of light emitted by the star in the galaxy. And the reason is due to the fact that these black holes do not sit isolated at the center of the galaxies. They are surrounded by a disk of hot gas, slowly, but not so slowly, actually falling on it. And that's what this video represents. At the center, we have the black hole, which is, of course, black. And surrounding the black hole, we have this disk of hot gas that is responsible for emitting the X-rays that we see. So the X-rays do not come from the black hole. They come from the gas falling on the black hole. You may think, oh, that's a very exotic thing. Come on, how many of these thick galaxies can be in the universe? One, two. Well, the very fact is that whenever you point at a random position in the sky, with whatever X-ray telescope you have available in this moment. The majority of the sources that you measure in X-rays are actually active galaxies. They are normal galaxies, they are stars, they are cluster of galaxies. Oh, yeah. Most of them are actually accreting black holes. So X-rays are the wavelength to make astrophysics of black holes. There is no other wavelength where this is possible. Why is this important? First of all, because we like black holes and we like to know how they are. But more importantly, black holes, they seem actually to have an important role in the life of all galaxies. A black hole is a tiny, is a tiny thing. This is a representation of a galaxy a bit like ours with a disk and a bulge. On the scale of this galaxy, a black hole is as big as a DNA filament. Irrelevant. However, since a couple of decades, we know that if we plot the velocity of stars in the bulge of a galaxy against the black hole mass at the center of the galaxy, these quantities are very well correlated. So, somewhat, there is a tiny bit, it is like a, a tiny bit in my cells, which is actually deciding how I have to shape. How is it possible that the stars in the bulge of a huge galaxy knows about what happens in a tiny bit at the center? We believe that the reason is one of the possibilities, not sure, but one of the possibilities are black hole winds. Once again, the word is misleading. These are not winds emitted by the black holes. But somewhat the energy of the matter, of the gas, which is falling on the black hole, at some point is no longer used, is no longer lost in increasing the temperature, but is lost in creating a wind matter which is ejected at very high velocity from the vicinity of the black hole. And the energy of this gas is so strong that it can affect the host galaxies at years, light years distant from the black hole. 
That's an idea, an idea, an hypothesis. Can we test this hypothesis experimentally? So, in order to answer this question, let me make a small trick. This is another X-ray spectrum. Funny shape, but you know, you see here lines. Typical spectrum that we may observe with Beethoven in the future. Now, let me make a small uh, funny joke. Let me rotate the spectrum. And now, what there were emission lines in the original spectrum, now they are lines in absorption. And this is actually you know, a bit of a joke, but it's actually what happens more or less in real life. In real life, if I have a hot gas, this hot gas emits a spectrum full of emission lines in X-rays, for instance. If actually I put this hot source in front of the, behind the region of cool gas, actually what I'm going to see is that the cool gas absorbs photons at the same energies where a hot gas was emitting light. So I can actually use an X-ray spectrum not to probe the properties of the hot gas emitting lines, but to probe the property of this cool gas that is between us and the hot source. And that's the idea. The hot source is the matter very close to the black hole. The cooler gas is the wind. And what we measure is the absorption spectrum. And why is the absorption spectrum so important? So that's now the unveiling the trick. This is the spectrum that we hope to observe of a black hole wind, so a wind in an AGM. And you see these nice absorption lines. So why is this important? Because in order to know if these winds are indeed affecting the environment of the host galaxy, I need to measure the velocity of the gas, the density of the gas, and also where the wind was launched. All these quantities can be determined only through X-ray spectroscopy. So only these spectra, the Itomi spectra, will be able to tell me if indeed winds coming from the accretion disk across the black hole are responsible for this feedback. It's how we call this phenomenon that the black hole mass and velocity of the star are related. But we gain with this also a bonus. And the bonus is that we can know directly something about the spin of the black hole. In order to understand why this happens, remember what I put in the slide on the Doppler effect. If the gas is moving toward us, more energy, higher frequency, smaller wavelength. Away from us, less energy, lower frequency, larger wavelength. Now let's cancel toward us and away from us. These statements remain true. And we have a phenomenon, once again, that can be explained only by general relativity, which is called the gravitational redshift. Simply stated, if I had a photon emitted very, emitted very close to the black hole, but still be you know, on our side with respect to the event horizon, before this light can reach us, this uh, photon can reach us, it has to win the pull of the gravitational force of the black hole. And in order to go, to escape from this pull, it loses energy. So, we will see it at the lower frequency. The general relativity is telling us that the matter is not free to go close to a black hole indefinitely. It has to stop at some point. And where it stops depends on whether the black hole is spinning or not. Summarizing. If I measure a photon coming from there, and I see that these photons have lost energy before reaching us, 
by the amount of energy they lost, I can determine the gravitational redshift. So I can know how close the matter can reach the black hole. So I can determine the speed. So in one shot, I know if black holes affect the host galaxy and a fundamental property of the black hole, which is the speed, which once again has stressed all the X-ray measurements can provide you. So I close my public talk here. I don't have much to say as a sort of conclusion, but the only thing I can say is that in this room uh, there are 20 colleagues, maybe, and uh, there is none of them, maybe 30, there is none of them who is not looking forward at the Tommy results and uh, believe that there will be a revolution in the history of uh, history astronomy, together with Astrosat and together with the other missions that are being prepared here in Asia and that will shift the attention of the whole X-ray community and the X-ray astronomical community and the astronomical community to this part of the world. So with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you.